Tonight's presentation is Rotax 912 engines for Sonics aircraft. With me tonight is Mark Shabel. He's the owner and president of Sonics LLC. He's been with the company since 2003. He also volunteers to serve on our EA safety committee. And he's also participated in the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee working on system component failure, non-power plant. And of course, he's an EA member. Mark, welcome to tonight's webinar. I appreciate you coming on and sharing some of uh, what you've learned about Rotax engines here in the last couple of years. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And uh, I look forward to showing folks um, not only what we've done in the factory, and that's a bit of a, of a story in terms of the development of the installation, but also talking about what uh, our customers have done through the years. Um, so uh, I'll give you a little brief history for those maybe who aren't as familiar with Sonics. Um, Sonics has uh, been around since uh, 1998, so we're well over 20 years old now. I think we have another anniversary coming up here soon. And uh, we have three major product lines. Um, Sonics uh, itself, the main entity, uh, is all about kit aircraft. Um, Sonics Aerospace, you see the logo there on the lower left. Um, that's uh, more to do with uh, mostly unmanned aircraft, so we really won't talk about that this evening. Um, and then there's Aero Conversions, uh, which is a brand that that uh, does some engines and accessories and some other parts. So just going through the aircraft here, and, and uh, for those not familiar, we basically have a line of uh, several models of piston aircraft and uh, also uh, a jet, soon to be two different jets. I, I don't have any slides about the jets up here tonight because it's not really relevant. But uh, of course, we have our original model, the Sonics, and uh, you'll see there um, we have a little dash B after it. Uh, about um, 2016, we updated the original design with some uh, new features in terms of a little bit more cockpit space, uh, a little bit more fuel, some things like that. And uh, you can learn all about it on our website. Um, so this is the original airplane that was uh, built in uh, um, in the late 90s, and uh, the plans were first made available in 1998, and then of course the kits uh, evolved from there over time, and uh, till uh, we, what we have today in terms of a uh, sort of a fully hashed out uh, modern kit. Um, all of our aircraft, in terms of our piston aircraft, are uh, LSA compliant, or at least certainly eligible. Um, they all feature removable wings, um, and in, in the case of our single place aircraft, folding wings. Um, and uh, the, the, the bottom line here in terms of what we offer, again, for those not familiar, our slogan is the best performance per dollar. So the idea is to be able to uh, build an airplane uh, very economically um, and get a really nice performance out of the airplane. You can see some of the uh, specifications there on the Sonics and um, build and fly for, that's your basically your um, your total cost at the base level of everything, base model everything, sort of the minimum you would spend from the kit to get an airplane flying, including the cost, of course, of the kit itself and engine and everything else. Um, the YXB is um, just like the Sonics, it just has that what we call Y tail on the back. And uh, it's not a V tail, you'll see we have the little rudder on the bottom, so it's the shape of a letter Y, it gives us a little more yaw authority uh, and control, and so we call it a Y tail. Um, it's uh, no real difference between the YX and the Sonics, it's just uh, there because it looks cool. And it's been a very popular model, and it is of course what we built at One Week Wonder. The Xenos, um, now the Xenos B, with all the new B model features, as you can see here in the sort of the three view plan plan view of the aircraft, is uh, is a very uh, long winged thing. It's a motor glider, so the whole um, mission is to self launch and do some soaring and uh, and be able to fire the engine back up again whenever you need to climb or or come home or go somewhere else for some more lift. Um, interesting note, uh, if you're checking out our website, uh, we do now have electric propulsion available for the Xenos. 
uh, via the uh, zero motorcycle uh, installation that was developed actually by a customer of ours and uh, someone who is actually one of the original developers of the zero motorcycle and uh, name dropping a little bit Paul Dye of Kit Plains Magazine and uh, former, former home built council member at EAA um, is actually doing uh, a, a, an electric uh, installation on his Xenos so you'll be seeing more about that in uh, in the future and you've probably already seen some of it in the pages of Kit Plains Magazine and then there's the 1X uh, kit and that's our single place aircraft and that does have folding wings uh, with a fixed center section and uh, those outboard wings so the portion that fold them they are of course also easily removable and uh, that's uh, just a center line seating single place airplane uh, the idea being the absolute um, lowest cost offering in the Sonics uh, stable of aircraft and uh, uh, you can see there in terms of the build and fly cost. And then, of course, I'd be remiss in giving this webinar about uh, Rotax installations in our aircraft if I didn't give um, a disclaimer here that, of course, we do um, have the Aero Conversions product line uh, and we sell, uh, develop and sell the Aero-V engine kit which is a uh, VW derived engine and it's a kit you the builder puts it together and we have the Aero V turbo uh, the normally aspirated Aero V puts out 80 horse and the turbo uh, produces 100 at sea level and then we have things like the Aero injector which is a very simple throttle body injector that we like to use on all of our aircraft whenever possible um, even on non Aero V engine installations particularly uh, on the Jabra 3300 which I'll talk about here in a little bit and we've even had some customers use the Aero injector on Rotax engines in the past um, especially uh, and in particular an air show team um, down in um, I believe it's Argentina, if I'm not mistaken, and um, uh, the, the aero injector as, as well as a modified oil system allowed them to do an aerobatic show. And things like uh, trim systems there on the left, uh, our own hydraulic brake system there in the middle and the lower right and throttle quadrants and a number of other little nifty um, accessories that are available not just for Sonics but for anybody building an experimental aircraft. Uh, you may want to check out some of our products at aeroconversions.com. So when it comes to power options, we uh, have expanded them, especially since the advent of the B models in 2016. And although, you know, of course, AeroV and Aero Conversions is, is our, uh, our product, our company, our product line, um, and of course, we want to we want to sell the AeroV. Um, we recognize that there are um, a lot of different folks out there building airplanes and they have a lot of different missions and a lot of different preferences in terms of what they want uh, firewall forward. So uh, the more that we expand uh, what you can hang on the front of the airplane, uh, the more universal appeal we have with builders. And obviously uh, the idea there is to uh, sell more airframes, which is uh, uh, important and um, and just giving people options. So of course we have the AeroV and the AeroV Turbo installation. You can see there the picture of the kit um, laid out on the floor. And yes, it, it literally is a kit. Um, and you know if you you built the airframe, um, the the engine kit, although it might on the surface sound very intimidating, um, is actually a relatively simple assembly process. Um, but you got to follow the manual, <laughs> and uh, and of course uh, we have technical support available for our builders, of building airframes, or of course the engines. Uh, Jabra 3300 has also been a very popular engine option and something that we've offered ever since the 3300 Jabra came along, um, and that would have been, I believe, around 98, 99 time frame. Actually, we originally worked with the Jabra 2200, um, which we don't see much use of anymore, and uh, we actually, in the B models, don't support it because it's just not quite enough weight on the nose, uh, a little bit too light for, for good weight and balance. The Jabra 3300 is a 120 horse six cylinder air cooled direct drive engine and um, it's uh, uh, been like I said very popular. I would say in the worldwide fleet of uh, customer aircraft the engine installations are split almost uh, exactly down the middle 50-50 in terms of the, the 
the majority of the airplanes and projects out there uh, these days since 1998 between Jabiru 3300 and, um, and the Aero-V or Aero-V Turbo. And uh, that's uh, where we get some of our best performances with that 120 horsepower engine. And uh, the turbo does very well for us as well. And I'll show you uh, some performance stuff here in comparison. Uh, we also, since uh, since the B models came along um, in 2016, uh, started making motor mounts for the four-cylinder UL power engines. And I'll talk about those a little bit uh, as well. And then, of course, the Rotax, we started making motor mounts for that, again, with the advent of the B models. So I want to just talk a little bit about um, the choices and particularly um, the choices maybe that um, are better suited for a Sonics aircraft. And um, although I'm giving a webinar about Rotax installations, um, I, I do have to say that our preference as a factory, and, and certainly mine personally, is still for the direct drive um, air-cooled engines. And um, one for cost, um, although things like the UL Power are not cheap either, um, but also just basically for simplicity of the installation. Um, but, you know, we've had a lot of customers very successful with the Rotex installation, and it is a valid choice for those that really want to do it. So here you can see uh, the performance numbers, kind of giving as much as we can an apples to apples comparison. Um, this is in a Sonex or a YX, essentially what we get for performance. Um, 80 horsepower Aero-V, you can see there in climb, about a thousand feet per minute. Um, about 130 miles an hour true airspeed in a Sonics uh, or a YX at about 3,000 feet, and we can true out at about 150 miles an hour at 8,000 feet, uh, again, with the 80-horse Aero-V. Uh, same numbers would apply uh, for the Jabiru 2200 for uh, folks with A-model Sonics that have those installations as well. That's about what you'd see there. Um, the Aero-V Turbo uh, does quite well, and um, it um, uh, does some things a little bit out of um, what you might predict, basically because of the turbocharging. Uh, even when we're running with virtually no boost, we still do have a little bit of boost um, that is uh, uh, just taking out any intake inefficiencies and, and doing, doing a lot of good for us. So we're climbing about 1,500 feet a minute on average. Um, chewing out uh, 150 miles an hour, uh, low level. Again, sort of all these numbers are basically economy cruise numbers for cruise. We can certainly uh, go much faster with the turbo, but uh, being turbocharged, we will be burning more gas. Um, and 165 is a good cruise number at 8,000 feet with the turbo. Uh, 3300 Jabiru, um, you know, again, more climb yet with 120 horse, uh, about 2,000 feet per minute. Um, 150 miles an hour down low, 170 miles a, an hour at uh, 8,000 feet is a true airspeed. Um, so again, you can see why uh, that's been so popular through the years as well. Uh, the Rotax, uh, based on uh, the performance that we've observed in, uh, in our installation, uh, particularly with the One Week Wonder and uh, also from some of our customers, um, uh, these numbers seem to be about what what the installation does. So about 1,500 feet per minute, um, and that's um, you know very comparable to the Aero-V Turbo. About 135 miles an hour true at, uh, at uh, 3,000 feet. Again, the Turbo does a little bit better just because of the, again, the, uh, the very small amount of boost in the intake manifold that's uh, just giving it a little bit more performance there at the lower altitudes. Um, up at 8,000 feet, uh, again, we're very competitive with the, what the Turbo does at about uh, 165 miles an hour uh, true. Um, so a very, very good performing engine, and like I said, a very valid choice uh, uh, for the aircraft. Now, in this webinar, I'm focusing only on the 100-horse Rotax. Um, you could certainly do the 80-horse models as well. Uh, we don't have any performance uh, experience in terms of being able to give you numbers here, but basically everything that I'm going to be talking about tonight uh, could certainly apply to the 80-horse Rotax installations as well. Um, and then UL Power, they have a line of uh, four different four-cylinder engines, basically two different models, and each model has two different compression ratios. Um, and you can see all of those on our website if you want to learn more about them. 
Um, so that's where you see the little gray bar there. The, the, the blue bar in the graph is um, the 97 horse. The end of the gray bar is the 130 horse engine. And um, so you can see there, you know, the range of uh, uh, performance and climb about 1300 to 2200 feet per minute. Now I will say that I don't have a ton of customer data in the Sonics, although we do have several customers flying it. Um, in terms of uh, what they're seeing with these numbers, um, knowing that that it's um, the RPM range that it works in, the kind of prop we put on it, and the power, uh, we we can give you a pretty good estimate um, of what these engines do will do in a Sonics, and that's what the asterisk is there, just uh, showing that these are estimates, but um, feeling pretty good about them, and just sort of spot checking some customer numbers that I've had. Uh, cruise again, you're in that 135 mile an hour to 160 miles an hour, true at 3,000 feet, might might be a little less at the top end. Um, you know, you do have 10 more horsepower than the Jabra 3300. Um, I guess it really depends on what what kind of fuel you want to burn, um, and you know how you know sometimes economy cruise numbers published by engine manufacturers tend to be a little bit on the low side of RPM, um, and for some manufacturers on the high side. Uh, and then cruise at 8,000 feet again, you know we've got that range, um, um, 158 to about 178 miles an hour true airspeed. Um, yeah. You know, certainly we know the 130 horse UL power will do greater than 170 miles an hour because the Jabra 3300 is doing 170. So that's kind of where I'm putting it there is my estimate. And uh, be would love to hear from folks operating the engine in Asonics to uh, prove me wrong or uh, help me adjust those numbers in future presentations. All right, costs. Um, so that's another consideration when you're choosing an engine for your aircraft, especially when you're building a Sonics and um, you know the idea is to build something economically. So you can see um, you know the AeroV price uh, all the way on up to the UL Power 130 horse engine, um, which uh, I believe that has gone up now. Um, uh, so it's about I think it's 26,000 euro. Uh, for the 130 horse UL power engine. So in US dollars, that's competitive with like a Lycoming 0320 there at the top end of the price. Um, installation cost is another um, area. And I, I gave installation prices here, installation estimates, I should say, including the propeller. Um, this is using all of our uh, Sensenic uh, fixed pitch uh, wood or wood core composite coated props. Um, which we like to use, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of the propellers. Um, and you can see they're all kind of in that $3,000 range for installation, uh, except the Rotax. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit. Uh, there is just more to the installation, and you're going to spend more money installing the engine. And you can see the range of the Rotax prices, since we're here to talk about Rotax. I looked these up on LEAF actually yesterday. So um, the ULS uh, per producing 100 horse, that's the carbureted engine, 20,585, and the current um, uh, injected um, ECU controlled engine price, the 912 IS, 23,754, as quoted by uh, Leading Edge Airfoils, which is our local dealer here in the uh, Midwest. Um, and then of course, fuel burns, component of cost, and uh, you can see we're all pretty competitive here in terms of um, what, um, what they're advertising or what we experience in the aircraft to hit some of those cruise numbers that I showed you in the last slide. Um, and, um, you know, we'll see, um, you know, what, again, the UL power uh, installations do, but these are kind of the the advertised slash estimated numbers there. And I'm looking forward to working with the 130 horse UL power engine in the upcoming Sonics High Wing that we're uh, designing. And I'll be giving a webinar about that in uh, February. Uh, so tune into that if you're interested in that aircraft. So some other things just to get again, in all fairness, to give you an apples to apples um, comparison or, you know, uh, way to make your decision about what engine to put in your Sonics. Um, the Sonics, we pride ourselves on building an airplane that is aerobatic. Uh, the Rotax, you should know, is not approved for aerobatics. And, you know, again, I don't want to take pot shots at the Rotax, so that's not why we're here. But, like I said, 
Um, our preference is certainly the simpler direct drive air cooled engines. Um, and, um, you know, you just, like John Monette always says, just look at it. Um, and you can see there the comparison of the slides. The Rotax is a, what I would call a busy engine. There's a lot going on there. There's uh, a lot of plumbing. Um, and uh, in the case of the IS, obviously a lot of electronics and a lot of wiring, uh, and you have radiators and things as well. So there's definitely more to the installation, which is something uh, that you should consider when you're considering everything uh, involved with making a decision about what engine to put in your airplane. All right, so enough of that. Um, if you are still here uh, listening, you are dyed in the wool Rotax fan and uh, you're ready to go forward. So let's talk about it. Um, so obviously here, uh, we, we got our Rotax experience in terms of the factory uh, through the one week wonder um, and the preparation for that event with uh, a factory installation. Actually, uh, my uh, production manager, Chris Nash, uh, he's partners with our warehouse manager, uh, Steve Severson, and um, they they have a Sonix, um, and Chris decided to put the Rotax 912 IS in it uh, when we decided to do the One Week Wonder so that we could uh, get a start in um, uh, getting the installation figured out. So there, here you see the end of the One Week Wonder. I won't spend a lot of time talking about the, that event. That's a webinar in and of itself. Uh, on the left there in the high five is Nino Tavio from uh, Kodiak, uh, basically Rotax dealer. He's uh, sort of universally known as the Rotax whiz, um, and he's a great guy and great to work with. And then on the right of your screen uh, in the high five is Casey Cooper, who is um, a uh, customer of ours who is has a Rotax installation, and he's been incredibly helpful. And I'll talk about him and his, his installation quite a bit tonight. Um, and uh, again, great guy. He actually, him and his father own a business working on Rotaxes, um, uh, all day uh, working on customer airplanes and Rotax installations. So he's a wealth of knowledge as well. And he's in the Tucson, Arizona area. So um, the first thing when you're developing a Rotax installation that you have to consider is how are you gonna mount the engine? Um, the Rotax is a, I wanna say a little bit unconventional in terms of um, the mount provisions in the engine. Basically the case has uh, threaded bolt points in it that you have to pick up for mounts. And there are basically two different ways to mount it. You have either a bed mount or you have a ring mount. Um, we uh, elected at Sonics in, uh, when we were developing the B models and the engine mount for Rotax um, uh, to go with a bed mount. And I should also mention that we do also have these engine mounts, the welded portion for uh, our legacy, our A model aircraft as well too. So I don't mean to exclude those people when I talk so much about the B models, but that was really the start of the, the Rotax installation offering from Sonics, which is why I bring it up. So uh, you can get these mounts from us. Um, the, mo the welded motor mount uh, price depends on whether you're uh, tricycle gear or tail dragger. Um, I believe the tail dragger is the most expensive, and you're you're about I think twenty two or twenty three hundred dollars for the weldment. Um, and uh, you'd need uh, you know that's regardless of what engine you're you're running, whether it's Aero V or Jabiru or UL Power or Rotax, uh, you're gonna have to buy the, the airframe motor mount itself. Um, and then there's our aero conversions mount system. You can see there the, the anodized red uh, angles uh, that are sort of nested inside of each other with the, um, with the bushings. Um, those are actually berry mounts. And uh, the whole idea there is we're picking up the mounting points in the bottom portion of the case and, uh, and we're uh, basically doing the, the dampening and the isolation uh, with those angles. Um, the Rotax, because of its reduction drive, it does like to shake a lot, especially when you shut the engine down. Um, and so we do a lot to try to mitigate that movement. And I'll, I'll talk more about that when I talk about some other points of the installation. A lot of people really like the ring mount out there in the builder community. And um, we did not do the ring mount um, because, um, well, just look at the price. Um, you know, let me go back a slide. So what was that again? 450 
bucks uh, essentially for our mount system and uh, 1200 to 1300 really for the ring mount the shock mount rubbers are ridiculously expensive it's 680 dollars practically um, and you can see it there the diagram of it that you see in all the catalogs um, whether it be aircraft spruce or reese uh, uh, leaf or California power systems, you name it. Um, and again, you still need an airframe mount then to connect to this ring. So basically, um, let me get my pen out here. Um, these points here, you can see what I'm doing with my highlighter uh, when the stream catches up. Those are the points that bolt to the engine case. So I believe if I'm not mistaken, and it's been a little while since I looked at this, these lower points are the same points that we bolt uh, the, the back end of our bed mount into. And then these upper points are obviously higher up in the back of the case. Um, you have your shock mount rubbers there, those um, uh, almost $700 little devils. And uh, those have to connect to a larger airframe mount. Um, so if you imagine amount here so that's that's enough drawing for me but anyway that goes to the fuselage so um, yeah you still need an engine mount on top of that and that's basically what drove the decision for us to um, to, to not do the ring mount now some customers uh, have made their own ring mounts in the past and usually they make them to pick up one of our existing mounts. Um, I believe the one on the left there is uh, made to pick up the mount points of the Aero-V mount. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the one on the right is for the Jabber 3300 uh, mount that we have. Um, I know customers have done both. And that, uh, uh, that one on the right might also be Aero-V, but uh, customers have uh, done both uh, basically which mount they like better that they wanted to adapt to or sometimes what mount did they already have uh, keep in mind a lot of Rotex installations were made before we ever offered engine mounts and um, before we even really as a company were willing to even talk about Rotex um, as an option so uh, people have been kind of forging their own way and doing these installations through the years um, which you know their experiences and the performance they got is kind of what encouraged us to uh, to offer the option as far as mounts ourselves most people don't want to make their own ring mount though however so again uh, for us to produce something uh, that um, for, to sell that people would want to put in the airplane. You know, our mission at Sonics is to be economical uh, at the same time that we offer performance. So the bed mount is uh, the way to go there. Um, another big sort of pet peeve of us with uh, of Sonics uh, when it comes to Rotex installations is that a lot of the installations you see out there put the radiators, you know, way out in front, big flat plate drag area. And of course, you know, we, we leverage performance out of our airplanes, especially using smaller engines like 80 horsepower engines, for instance, and still getting really good performance out of being very streamlined and of course lightweight as well. So this picture here, you know, this is the Aero-V turbo installation. It's kind of the, I'll say gold standard in terms of how clean you want your airplane to be and your cowling installation. This is what you're looking for, uh, not this. And uh, before anybody starts rumors, this is not a preview of the Sonics high wing, although it is red. Uh, this is actually an Aeropract um, I believe uh, made in the Ukraine uh, and still in production even during the war I heard. But uh, this is of course a slower airplane. Um, you can tell, you know, sort of um, not quite an ultralight but it's meant to be more of a stole airplane and uh, maybe they don't mind the drag of, uh, of the big radiator sticking out the front. But that's definitely not what we want in the Sonics. Now here's um, a customer installation that we've sort of paid attention to that we really like. This is uh, Gary B and I'm I uh, apologize, I don't have his last name. A lot of these folks that I'm going to be showing pictures from are um, people we became aware of through our customers' online discussion group. Uh, SonicsBuilders.net, if you want to check it out, is the web address, and you can find all this stuff and more. Um, so Gary um, has had a, a, a Rotex installation flying since, I believe, 
believe it's been about um, 1998, if I'm not mistaken. So he's got a lot of hours on the installation. This is an early picture of insta his installations. And uh, you can see here he's got um, kind of an elongated version of our inlet duct. And um, that is um, something that he did. He kind of bifurcated it. Uh, with one going to one area going to his radiator, and I believe another going to his oil cooler. I have some more pictures of this installation later. And then, there's, of course, there's Casey Cooper. Uh, this is sort of his retooled installation. He had um, uh, another cowling and sort of another arrangement of his uh, radiator and oil cooler that was a lot more draggy, and he went kind of went back to the drawing board. That worked for him uh, quite well, actually. But um, he he kind of wanted to clean it up. And uh, he did that before coming to AirVenture this year and uh, came out with, uh, I think, a, a pretty airplane, really nice uh, treatment. Um, and uh, here you can see a little bit more in profile view um, that, yes, indeed, it is still very streamlined in this area um, and uh, not um, just not a lot of stuff hanging out, not a lot of drag. So we like that. And next slide, there we go. So cooling, um, cooling is definitely a uh, a consideration, uh, just like any engine, uh, whether it be uh, completely air cooled or a uh, partially air cooled and partially water cooled. In the case of the Rotax 912 series, um, now the Rotaxes, uh, the 912s typically don't get much in the way of baffling, and sometimes, like in this case, this is Gary B's airplane again. Um, you, uh, you, there is some baffling and, um, uh, they actually have a fiberglass baffle for the cylinders, which is optional. And, um, generally you don't see it used a whole lot. Um, the cylinders typically, as long as you're keeping the, the liquid coolants, the water and, and of course the oil at a reasonable temperature, um, just sort of the ambient inlet air in the cowling, uh, just sort of uh, free in the cowling as long as it's uh, moving, uh, has, a, has a proper flow through through the cowling and exiting um, is all you need without, without baffling. But you can see here that uh, Gary has his radiator in the back and he has, um, um, ducted it all the way to the front here. And uh, you can see over here is where his inlet used to be before he closed it off. He just didn't need that much cooling. He was able to go back to sort of the standard sonic size of uh, cooling. And you can see for his cylinders, um, he's only using the right-hand side inlet to get uh, air to cool the cylinders. And that might be some of what this baffle is about. Um, is just making sure that he's retaining more air in this area or on that on, on that left side. Um, so uh, that seems to be working well for him, and it's certainly something that we paid attention to when considering how to do. Uh, here's that bifurcation that I was talking about, and actually I was mistaken. Uh, that's not for the oil cooler. I, that might be going to cylinders uh, like that. Um, I haven't had a conversation with Gary about the installation specifically. He actually does have his oil cooler um, in the bottom, and we'll see that in the next slide. If I can erase my drawing, there we go. So here you can see it with the cowling off and the the baffle or the baffling and the shrouds taken off. So he's got his oil cooler here on the bottom, and he's um, you know getting air to it uh, through through the the underside of the cowling. I don't unfortunately have a good picture of what that inlet looks like, um, but it must be rather unobtrusive because you, you couldn't see it from that uh, front view that we just saw of the airplane or from that nice air to air shot. Um, and then over here, um, he has his coolant radiator um, and that's what gets that, um, that ducting from the inlet over here in the front and you can see you know, there's a line of piano hinge so you must just drop a hinge pin in to kind of secure that uh, uh, that that shroud to the radiator and then here is a look at the bottom of uh, the bottom of the cowling near the firewall that's his exit and um, he uh, um, obviously you want a ratio there typically it's 130 percent of your inlet area is what you want for exit in order for proper cooling and that that appears to be roughly what he has there 
All right, and then back to Casey Cooper's engine. Uh, he's got an inst interesting installation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got a drink of water there. Um, and what he's done and he, is he has the oil cooler and the radiator on the bottom of his cowling under the engine. So you can actually see the aero conversions mount bars there, which Casey actually helped us design, by the way. Um, and he has, here is the oil cooler in front. And then um, behind it is the actual radiator. So it's kind of back here, if you can imagine that in, in perspective. And uh, you can see his inlet here. And uh, he's got some NACAs here. And I think this is about um, just kind of keeping um, the exhaust um, the exhaust a little bit cooled uh, that's inside the cowling. I have to ask him about that. He's got these uh, neat little grids in here. He's he's taken our regular inlets. He's made them a little bit smaller, mostly because he has this uh, big spinner there, which is certainly another complication. Um, you know, the whole idea of designing an installation for um, for any engine, uh, and particularly the Rotax for our customers, is to, you know, really kind of minimize the amount of custom fiberglass work that the customer has to do. And um, certainly if something, um, you know, along these lines, what he has here were to become part of our factory installation, we would have either a, a specific cowling for it or more than likely at least a preformed piece like this, for instance, that you can glass into your stock cowl that you get from us um, but this is what he's done it's a nice looking installation and it's working well for him he also has a couple of vents up here and um, those are uh, to cool his although he, he doesn't have an is um, he does still have i believe his ignition modules are up there and that's just helping to uh, keep uh, some of those components cool and casey if i'm wrong about what they're for you can write in and correct me and here's just a look at what he's doing with his oil cooler and his radiator. It's basically the P51 trick, if you will. The P51's got, uh, of course, a water-cooled Merlin engine. It's got its radiator on the belly. And then you have this uh, sort of um, uh, uh, shaped, this NACA-shaped um, uh, box that goes around it that accelerates the air um, out and um, basically the idea is that it actually gives you some thrust kind of compensating for any drag that you have from the inlet um, you know I think it you know I don't know I'm not willing to say that that's what's going on in Casey's airplane um, but you know I have to see the numbers but it seems to be working for him and it's an interesting installation All right, then here's uh, Adele in uh, the Paris area, and she's got another nice um, um, streamlined installation. Um, in uh, With the B models, we started doing the side cooling exits, and um, basically, it um, doesn't look like she has our specific fiberglass pieces that we use and sell, but she did something kind of like it, you know, uh, um, derived from it or maybe inspired by it. And the idea there is that we like to do those those inlets on the side uh, instead of in the bottom, because when you think about it, the bottom of the airplane, especially when you have an airplane that's shaped so much like an airfoil as the Sonics is, um, that um, you have a lot of positive pressure up underneath here. And um, so you want to not have to fight that with a big lip, like you saw in um, the picture of uh, Gary B's installation. You have to have kind of a lip there to um, create suction and, and make the air want to flow out the bottom. Um, now with, with the side exit, and it looks like she does have a lip here, uh, just to encourage the air to go out. But, you know, in, in, in our experience with the B models, we haven't typically needed that. It, uh, we don't have that, that extra positive pressure up here in the side, and we um, uh, can get away without the lip. Now, you can see here as well, and unfortunately, I don't have a good picture of her cowling off, but I've got to imagine she's um, doing something with the radiators in the back. You can see a bifurcator there. So she's splitting the air um, for, you know, cylinders and 
you know, oil cooler or, or radiators. Um, there's these cutouts here are probably dedicated to the radiators, and I'll tell you why I'm guessing that, or you'll see why I'm guessing that in some of my uh, future slides about the Sonics installation. All right, so the Sonics installation, uh, again, we, we took all of this, all of this uh, customer experience and knowledge through the years with their own Rotax installations and applied it to, well, what are we going to do on Chris's airplane and what are we going to do on One Week Wonder to make this a clean installation to reduce drag and really, um, uh, really kind of uh, enhance performance. Um, so you can see here, uh, like I was saying, we have the B model side exits here. Um, we have a really nice um, sort of un... I'll say unmolested shape <laughs> in terms of the original cowling. Uh, we do have a NACA scoop here for our um, for our air filter uh, to get air into the engine. That's important with the IS because um, you don't have fuel uh, cooling the intake manifold. So that can drive uh, uh, engine temperatures if you're taking ambient cowling air with just the air filter up here um, in or over here. Um, uh, without uh, getting it fresh, cold air from the outside. And you can see that we've got uh, radiators here on the side. And what we've done is our traditional um, uh, B-model uh, fiberglass exits, instead of glassing them to the inside of the cowling like we normally do, we actually adhere them to a box and to the firewall um, here. Uh, the box off the back of the, um, I hope you're not seeing that menu that po seems to pop up every time I draw, um, that um, the cowling just goes over it. And uh, you can see here we have some fasteners just to keep that sucked in. Mark, we don't see the menu. Great. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> Oh, I skipped a slide. All right. So um, the oil cooler uh, originally was on the bottom. And here's, you can see this nice shot from underneath the, uh, underneath the engine. You can see the oil cooler here in a very traditional location. And um, we did, uh, we do have a, a duct here uh, that we added to get it to this little inlet here. And uh, we also had, do have an exit at the firewall. Um, and although uh, we basically that's ratioed to 130% of this inlet here in front. Um, so all about getting uh, airflow through the oil cooler. Now that didn't it didn't actually work out too well for us. We we definitely were challenged with temperatures when we started flying, um, and a lot of it is that this inlet is it's kind of hard to see. But imagine you know it, normal normally um, on remote oil cooler installations on something like an Aero V, we have an inlet about this size and shape, actually positioned uh, more like here. And so it's getting um, it's more frontal area. It's uh, not sort of um, being um, insulated by a boundary layer, kind of going over this this bottom area of the cowling, where uh, I feel that what we had going on was that air was just kind of flowing outside the cowling and not necessarily getting directed um, into the inlet because too much of it was going this way. So we tried moving the oil cooler. And you can see here we've got a different oil cooler. Um, it's actually in the left-hand um, inlet of the cowling. Um, and um, uh, that definitely helped. Um, one of the things that it does complicate is electronics cooling. So if, uh, like I talked about with Casey's airplane, um, whether you have carbureted or IS, they essentially have the same type of ignition modules uh, here in the IS. And, uh, someone, someone with a carbureted engine is going to have to um, inform me if it's in the same location on the carbureted engines. Um, but there are the four ignition modules there. Um, we also have the ECU up here on the firewall. And then down lower on the firewall, we have the fuse box kind of hidden behind the engine there. All of those components are limited uh, by Rotax specifications to being exposed to or soaking up 
um, and having a temperature of 170, I believe it's 176 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, we do have um, uh, temperature stickers that give you a, uh, you know, they darken at each uh, benchmark of temperature and, um, you know, they stay that way. So you can see if, you know, the component's ever been overheated. But for our testing, we wanted to, um, uh, monitor the temperatures a lot more actively um, so that you know we can say uh, oh it we're getting too hot stop shut it down we got to take the cowling top of the cowling off and let let these things breathe we didn't want to find out uh, later that um, you know oh our temp stickers went over limit and that happened yesterday and maybe we fried a seven thousand dollar ecu not not cool so obviously we wanted to as far as as far as the re research development and testing and developing the installation we wanted to monitor it so that's this little mgl um, engine monitoring unit you see over here um, be we're using MGL avionics and not to get into, you know, too much about avionics. Um, they, they make, um, they have an engine computer called an RDAC. And typically for the engines we're used to using, it's basically a glorified terminal strip. And it goes on the front of the firewall and you plug in all of your inputs for EGT, CHT, oil pressure, oil temperature, um, RPM, you name it. And there's a lot of extra ports that you can put all kinds of extra stuff in typically. And so you can monitor basically any temperature you want. Well, because um, the IS and engines like the UL Power have all kinds of multi-pin connectors, um, it's much easier for customers if MGL makes an RDAC computer that just has the the pin the pin port for the engine so that's great except um it did not allow us to have open ports uh, without you know uh, getting in and opening up connectors and rewiring connectors so basically we just took this instrument here on the left and uh we powered up with a nine volt battery and um and really we just look at it after we fly um so when we shut the engine down park at the hangar we turn it on and watch the temps and uh, make sure that they don't get too high. And we're watching it as the temps are heat soaking through through the engine, through the cowling. Um, so again, with this moved oil cooler here, um, the issue that we found is that um, the air, um, when you're when you're shut down, um, you know, air typically wants to convect through your inlets here, and particularly, you know, if I had to estimate where it was, it'd be right here, the one at the bottom of the firewall. Um, fresh air wants to convect up and go out in a high area. So the highest opening, unless you open up the oil door up here, is your 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 inlets here. Well, we've largely blocked this inlet. Um, because of uh, with the oil cooler so these coils tend to get a little higher and they cool down a little bit slower now these coils always did get a little bit hotter even before we moved the oil cooler because of um, the coolant reservoir here and uh, you'll see on some installations i believe on a lot of 912 um, sorry on a lot of rotex um, rv12s or <laughs> excuse me vans rv12s um, you'll see some insulation actually safety wired underneath between um, this the coils and the cylinders and the um, and the coolant reservoir so, um, you know, we're managing that. We were considering maybe some some louvers up here to let stuff uh, heat escape a little bit better, maybe on both sides just to make it symmetrical, uh, kind of like what Casey Cooper had in that picture that I showed you. So, you know, that that was kind of um, you know the thought at you know at, at that point. Um, we also found that um, you know the radiators just weren't getting enough fresh air either um, and um, you know with with the oil cooler um, get, getting a little bit more air that helped but we found especially on the ground or if we're running you know above sort of cruise power setting um, we, things wanted to get hot so um, we experimented with um, just some scat tubing um, again, you know, you wanted to see what works before you spend all kinds of time, you know, modifying fiberglass or building baffles or what have you. So we just have some very simple scat tubing going back and blasting to the radiator. And uh, we also have, uh, you know, we do have, I'll talk about the exhaust here. We do have a muffler here, although it is wrapped, which helps. 
um, we added a bifurcator here um, attached to the side of the radiator on each side. And that just helps to, um, uh, again, sort of segregate and split the air, especially with the blast tube um, here. And that has helped tremendously. Um, we still do have a little bit of an issue on long taxis on hot days. And you can see here we've got a little inlet, um, um, uh, little shield here on uh, the oil cooler side on the left side, just to help, again, direct more air and not let air escape around the top and the bottom of the oil cooler uh, through these spaces. You can see our scat hose here. You can see we're pretty well blocked off for um, uh, helping that ignition module cool. Um, and then on the right side, on the passenger side, if you will, uh, of course, we have this big open area here for air to come in and go out when, uh, the, when the airplane's parked and it's cooling down. And we did also add those lips that I talked about in the side cooling exits. And uh, that helped as well. Um, so you can see here, everything's kind of an, um, an evolution. It's, um, it's a, um, a scientific process. You know, we take things one step at a time, try to only test one change at a time. And that, that can take some time. So then we look at Carl Bedgevel, if I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly, and uh, I won't even try to say the name of the town in Sweden. And this is a Rotex installation that was done quite a long time ago. You can see he's got uh, relatively small exits just sort of for the air-cooled portion of the cylinders. And he's got this giant NACA scoop on the side. Obviously, he's got his radiator over there. So, um, you know, we have our exit over here. And so we're thinking about, uh, or I'm thinking about, a small inlet. Now this one's giant, and uh, we don't really need it to be that big. I think we've proven that in our testing. Um, but something much smaller, maybe a, a quarter or a third this size, and uh, certainly not as obtrusive, um, you know, in terms of the looks of the cowling. Uh, this is actually something sent to me by Casey Cooper. Uh, this is a little pre-made fiberglass piece. Um, from, I believe, from FK light planes over in Europe uh, that he was doing on a customer aircraft installation on the side of the cowling directing to radiators. So that might be something that we try. Um, we may make our own version of it. Um, I would imagine that, you know, if it's from Europe, it's expensive. So, um, and no reason to pay the shipping. So uh, we may be coming up with something uh, like that as well. But here it is, it's December and we're in Oshkosh. And so we've kind of lost the opportunity to do a lot of testing in hot weather. So we're going to take our time over the winter and kind of come up with the next configuration that we're going to test and, um, and you know, get that going when spring weather comes. And of course, the airplane in one week wonder has got to fly to sun and fun. All right, I'm running out of time here. Actually, I'm probably already uh, past the time Charlie wanted me to go, uh, and we want to leave time for um, Q&A. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the last few things here and just try to breeze through it quick. Uh, exhaust systems, again, you're doing an installation. Um, you know, We only sell a motor mount, and so what are you going to do for exhaust? So this is what we've seen. Um, a lot of people like to use the standard sort of Rotax uh, log, if you will. Uh, in terms of that muffler. Now the Rotax, uh, Rotax talks a lot about back pressure and the need for a muffler. Uh, if you know anything about our other installations, we largely avoid mufflers uh, and we do long straight pipes, which tends to really mitigate uh, noise quite well and uh, work, work quite well. But in the Rotax, um, you kind of, you know, they say that you need to have a muffler. You'll see also that, um, you know, we have a tight cowling and the uh, exhaust can be a challenge. You can see Carl has got, or I'm sorry, Gary, this is Gary, Gary B, has got um, some bump outs glassed in here, uh, over there and over there to uh, make room for that exhaust. So, you know, we don't want people to have to go through that. But it works. And then Casey Cooper, he's also got a custom exhaust. You can see with his headers here, he's coming around the side of the cylinders on each side. And he's going here and he's got his mufflers here. So he has a muffler on each side. And you can see that he's got some 
um, some reflective tape here um, to protect his motor mount from, from the heat of the muffler. And you can see here his cowling exit and his uh, mufflers exiting here on each side. They're kind of coming in from an from a angle that uh, it's working for him. And then this is something I just saw on the builder's list just uh, yesterday as I was looking at, at customer Rotex installations. And this is kind of a neat four into one uh, in, intake. Unfortunately, I, uh, these are low res pictures, so it, it's, they don't show up well when you blow them up like this. But uh, kind of a neat four into one. Um, you can see he's at, obviously taken pains to um, make the exhaust equal length, the headers in the front and the back. And that's something Rotax talks about uh, when you ask them, you don't see it actually done a whole lot. You see a lot of installations, particularly with the Rotax log uh, muffler here in the back where um, you, um, you see sh very short pipes coming off the back of the engine and very long pipes coming around the front, uh, which is exactly what they tell you not to do. But everybody seems to be doing it, um, especially on a lot of other you know, non-sonics airplanes. Um, I don't know if this is a muffler or if it's just a big tailpipe. Sure looks cool to me. I would uh, would really love to hear how that engine sounds. And this is the guy that made his own ring mount. You can see it painted up here, incidentally. It seems to be working for him, although he hasn't flown yet. And his radiators at the bottom if we're just kind of looking at it and examining the installation. So uh, come to Toucan Exhaust. So this is a company that Casey Cooper had directed me to. And he dealt with in his business and he thought it was really cool. Um, you can see it's this um, sort of ring that goes around the heads and they can rotate all the way around depending on where you need them. And so it's really versatile. Um, so uh, people have probably heard the story already. I sent the company an email um, and who did I get an email back from? But the guy who's done all of the welding of all the motor mounts and all the other welded parts for Sonics is since the day that Sonics started in 1998. <laughs> so that was a pleasant surprise and we've been able to work with him really closely on our installation. Now um, you can see uh, back up, the um, the shape of this, um, not necessarily, this is on a Sonics, uh, I believe the legacy Sonics, um, not necessarily the best shape for the cowling. Um, so when we took it into SolidWorks and uh, in CAD, um, we suggested and asked Greg at Toucan to kind of rake everything back here to make the same circuit. Of course, the mufflers on the bottom, two mufflers, two cans, who can exhaust um, and that's uh, that's what that's about um, and it works really well for us uh, here in the upper left you can see uh, we did back pressure testing Rotex does have uh, maximum back pressure uh, specifications and so we did that testing and this exhaust uh, passes with flying colors you can see here we originally wanted to do nice long tail pipes going down um, to to a traditional sort of exit at the firewall, uh, fit really nice, looked beautiful. The problem is, like I said, the Rotex engine shakes and moves a lot in its mounts, and uh, the uh, the exhaust actually wanted to contact the motor mount. So uh, we did some um, you know some some run ups um, static on the ground with cowling off, looking looking specifically for that, and unfortunately. Uh, that was the case. So we ended up going with straight pipes. Um, in a lot of ways, much simpler, certainly lighter, um, and pretty cool looking. Sounds really nice. Uh, you can see we just have the tips exiting here on each side. All right, fuel system, just real quick. Um, so normally, um, you know, you'll notice, if you don't know about Sonics, we have a header tank. The fuel is actually under the glare shield up here. So in all of our carbureted installations, um, traditional, I'll say, installations, where you have the tank up here and the carb down low on the engine, we run gravity feet. So even though we're a low-wing airplane, we don't have fuel pumps, which is great. Gravity's never failed us. Um, if you have these injected engines, however, or something like a carbureted Rotax, where the carbs are way up here at the top of the engine, you do need a fuel pump. 
um, and you know you should you should have two for redundancy and of course with the IS you definitely need that so for people um, you know looking for what we did on the injected engine uh, we have the fuel pumps actually this is a picture from one week wonder here on the right you can see the rudder pedals hanging from the fuselage this angled surface here is the firewall and uh, you can see the fuel pump there on the left at the bottom of your screen, and um, and and we mount them uh, like that. Uh, you can also see we do add some stiffeners to the firewall, particularly for the IS where we have uh, so many components like the uh, the fuse box and the ECU, as well as the fuel pumps mounted there. So it's just some simple aluminum angle stiffeners um, on there is what we did. Um, here on the left, you can see this is the return line going back to the tank. So the fine filter for the fuel, um, you, know, you can see this back to the right picture, you can see this bulkhead fitting. This comes out back on the left picture down here, kind of behind the oil tank and goes to the fine filter. And that's this line coming up here to the right side heads. Um, then there's the crossover tube that the engine uh, comes with, or is installed, and then the fuel comes back out here and has a return here. Now this line is a vent line, and uh, it actually has a restriction, and it has a, a restricted orifice in here. I've got too many lines. It has a restricted orifice right here, uh, it, the whole so that you don't have, um, you know, fuel pressure trying to go back into your into your the wrong way into your filter um, and that's just so that if you have any sort of um, um, unporting of the fuel tank um, you can let air kind of go back up and rise um, you know the air goes up uh, go back up into the tank return now one thing i should mention is you always want your return line uh, in any um, pump system where you have a return line you want it away from the fuel sump uh, you don't want that turbulent or in some cases uh, heated fuel um, to be uh, to be sucked right back into the oil into the fuel sump at the bottom of the tank so uh, we have as you know in the sonics we have a filler neck here under this door and the return line just dumps right into the tank there All right, props. Um, so, um, we, like I mentioned, we like to use the the, the fixed pitch, um, the Sensenik wood core composite coated props. Um, they are a relative bargain versus a lot of your uh, multi-piece, multi-blade ground adjustable props. Um, we've also lost blades on ground adjustable props through the history of Sonics, so we've never really liked the idea of a ground adjustable prop that much. Not to say that you can't do it, it's just, you know, makes us a little nervous personally. Um, but they're out there and they're, they're, they're great, you can do them. Um, but anyway, we like these props, they're really lightweight. Now, the Rotax, uh, both the 80 horse and the 100 horse with the reduction drive, um, they have um, a lot of torque because you're taking RPM and you're turning it into torque with the reduction drive. So this is re a really wicked prop. This is 60 inches in diameter and 80 inches of pitch. Now, normally in something like a Jabber 3300, for example, you're gonna be about 60 inches in diameter and about 62 inches of pitch. Um, so that's that's quite a prop. It's really cool looking and it works really well. Um, and, and we use our little spinner here uh, that we like. And you can see we have a nice clean form factor of the cowling, very streamlined and don't have a big spinner to worry about, um, you know, with hardware and maintenance and everything else. And especially on our higher RPM engines like Jabru's and, and VW's, um, those spinners like to fatigue and just fly off the airplane and go past your canopy at, you know, 150 miles an hour. So that's not something that we enjoy. The, the lightweight prop also helps reduce the shaking quite a bit of the engine on shutdown. So um, one of the things that, you know, Casey uh, particularly had an issue with um, using our, our uh, traditional um, cowling setup um, with the small hole for the prop hub, as you can kind of see here, um, is that he was eroding his cowling um, when he shut the engine down. And, and he has a big, um, you know, a, a, a multi-blade um, uh, ground adjustable prop. And uh, this prop doesn't seem to have that issue. We 
have, are having really good success with it. Now, in terms of things that Sonics is going to be doing, coming out with to uh, support Rotax installations, we already do the motor mounts, we already do the mount bar system from aero conversions. Uh, we are going to be doing our own prop hub extension. Um, the installation does require an inch and seven eighths uh, thereabouts prop hub extension, and we never we didn't really like a lot of what was out there. Um, one of the things is that when you have a prop extension of this length, a lot of them are solid and have threaded um, bosses in them. So you put the bolts in from the front facing aft. And um, you have, which we do as well, but we have nylock nuts here. Or if you wanted to safety wire them, um, you could still do that between the nuts all around. Um, with some of those solid prop hub extensions, you have to do your safety wiring on the front and you can't make that work with our spinner. So you have to trash that and go with um, you know, a more traditional spinner or even like one of those little skull cap spinners um, of the same relative size. Of course, we want people to use our stuff. We want to make it easy for people, so we're making our own prop hub extension. And it has the, uh, the prop thrust lugs actually machined right in. They're not separate pieces. So that'll be coming soon. Um, we'll also be doing a Rotax oil tank mount. And um, you can see the little cutout here. We've actually designed it. And actually, um, there's a little contour up in here. It's hard to see. There's not a lot of contrast in that picture. And the idea being that um, this works with a tail dragger engine mount like you see here, but also um, works with a, a tri-gear engine mount that we have for our aircraft. So the mount tubes actually can pass sort of right through this box. And uh, that works well. And there you can see the oil, um, the oil tank's position uh, in terms of where we install it. Very, very uh, typical what you see on Rotex installations. Uh, another thing that uh, we're kind of proud of is this conical air filter can. Now the engine came with a cylindrical filter, and you'll see on a, on some aircraft installations, particularly like the RV12, they've got a giant NACA scoop here, um, kind of like that that aircraft from Sweden I showed you, and they put a cylindrical, I believe it's a cylindrical filter, and let me try an isometric drawing here, in there, in kind of an enclosure that um, the NACA scoop air gets, and then, um, you know, they duct off of it to the engine, and it's just big, and, you know, looks relatively heavy. This is just a, simply a can. And I asked Rotax, I asked Nino about using a conical uh, air filter, and he said, yes, it's fine. The, the cylindrical filter is actually what they use on their higher horsepower turbocharged engines. Um, so we went with a comparable conical filter. So if you imagine here, um, you have the filter. Here's the throttle body. Um, you have the filter inside here. Again, one of my really bad isometric drawings. Inside like that. And um, we can just easily duct it to, um, to a much smaller NACA scoop. And it works great. The engine takes full power at all speeds and works great. This, this assembly here only weighs 5.8 ounces. So uh, the, the filter is the heaviest part of the whole deal. Uh, you can see here we do have the 912 IS map sensor. Uh, in there in a little uh, nylon bung. So this is something that, again, will hit our website as well um, as a product here as we uh, get uh, further along with refining it and developing it. And then uh, we have the uh, throttle quadrants. So we don't uh, really like um, the, the Cessna style push-pull uh, throttle. We feel more like fighter pilots when we use the lever. <laughs> uh, it's just cooler and it just works well with more things like the aero injector uh, on our other engines. And these are the throttle quadrants we've had for years here on the left. Now for engines like the Rotax or if you're doing something like UL Power or a Bing carburetor, let's say you're running a Jabiru and you're not using our aero injector or using a Bing carburetor on a carbureted Rotax, you need more cable to travel. So that's why we came up with the Throttle Quadrant XL. It's got 2.6 inches of travel and it'll handle just about everything out there. Um, you can see like the pictures on the left that um, you know we engrave everything nice with the proper placarding and everything. These are some demonstrator units. One of them is in One Week Wonder. One of them is in, actually a handmade one is in Chris's airplane. Um, and eventually you know these will be engraved and it'll be um, a hashed out product. We've got a little bit of refining to do on those and then those will be on the market as well.
And then depending on what we do with the cooling setup and where we finally arrive, um, we do plan um, uh, if we stick with the system to have the mounts um, for the radiators. Um, we actually use Mylar's radiators, which is an aftermarket off-road, um, uh, mostly off-road vehicle radiator company. Um, and we may stick with those. We did have to modify them a little bit. We may have something made custom. We may just go with a Rotax radiator. Um, so we'll see what happens. But what we have now is we have um, uh, basically machine laser cut or CNC routed uh, boxels, uh, baffles here, boxes and um, our fiberglass piece there that comes with the cowling normally for a B model. And then we have these tabs on the engine mount and the tab on the bottom, there's another piece that gets, picks up the bottom of the radiator. So if we stick with that system and the ultimate installation, um, that'll be a product too. Here you can see it from the side. We have a couple of clips here, clipping the back of the fiberglass to the firewall just to stabilize everything. All right way out of time and I just want to say thank you um, to our staff. Um, they've just been rock stars this year uh, in terms of all the prep of this installation and all the R&D that we've done on it thus far um, and the, you know, the work that we have yet to do. And of course, One Week Wonder was a giant undertaking and our staff has been great. Um, I pointed out um, Casey Cooper, of course, with his installation and some of our other customers and thank you to all of them for doing a lot of the groundwork. I also have to particularly point out uh, Chris and Steve again, uh, there uh, with the fist bump there on the right of your screen. Um, and uh, that's Chris's airplane. And uh, that was sort of the, um, the prototype for the installation before we got to the one week wonder. And I'll turn it back over to you, Charlie, uh, with questions with, uh, with the, whatever time we have remaining. All right, Mark, appreciate the uh, presentation. It was excellent. I learned a lot myself. It was nice to get kind of a technical presentation. I know most of us home builders kind of enjoy that stuff, even though it might turn some other people off. Uh, we had uh, 170 people tonight, so thanks to John for reminding me to mention that. And thanks for everybody to tune in, who tuned in. Uh, Leo just asked, can we use auto gas with ethanol with the Rotax engine? Ooh, um, I don't like ethanol. Um, <laughs> With a uh, pressurized fuel system, it can be a bit manageable. Um, I would uh, refer you to your Rotax manual or the Rotax dealer for that information. I'm not the uh, clearinghouse of the final word on that. I, I personally wouldn't use it. Okay, and then Jason asks, um, uh, what is the silver tube connected to the 912 IS air intake? Almost looks like a muffler visible on the, on the first slide of the presentation. I think you covered that. That is uh the air filter that you were mentioning yeah so he probably yep. wrote that yep. question in before i right had a chance yep. to talk about it but yeah that's what that is awesome okay and another jason chimed in that rotax allows up to 10 percent ethanol okay uh, great and that is that is my understanding as well okay all right and uh Al alvaro Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. He says, since the Sonics Max engine installation is 200 pounds and the installed weight of a 912 is approximately 140 and the 914 is 170, can we <laughs> install the 914 in a Sonics or in the new high wing, high wing Sonics? Well, Turbo. so right now with our motor mounts, it's a one, one of the things about the bed mount is that it doesn't work with the turbocharged engines. And I believe the 914 is turbocharged. Um, so right now it's not an option. Um, if you wanted to go with a ring mount uh, or make your own, like some people have done, uh, that would be certainly doable. Um, you know, I don't know on the high wing if we're, you know, we put a lot of work into this mounting system. Um, our tendency is going to be to stick with it, um, but we'll see. Um, you know, we'll see where the demand signal is on that in terms of who, how many people want what. Okay. Uh, Darren asked, does the 60 inch diameter prop still have the seven inch ground clearance required when using the tri gear? Yeah, it's the same diameter as the Jabber 3300 prop. Okay, good. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's see here. John asked, do you have any takeoff distance for the various engines? Uh, as that's the main reason that people prefer the, prefer the Rotax to the VW. Uh, what about taller gears for better prop uh, and angle of attack? 
Okay, so um, takeoff distance, um, we have pretty short takeoff distance um, and there's been a bit of a thread going online in the groups about taller gear lately and um, you know, I, it, it's just not necessary. Um, you know, these are not stool, stole uh, bush planes. They're designed to be, you know, sort of relatively high performance airplanes. And although we pride ourselves on having an airplane that gets off the ground pretty quick, um, you know, we don't need to, one, make the ground handling of the tail dragger um, more difficult. We don't need to reduce visibility. Uh, again, making that that handling, that sight picture over the nose uh, worse. The airplane really likes to three point. It's a very easy airplane to land. And so we really like the deck attitude of the airplane. Also, um, you know, another reason why I sort of don't buy that taller gear thing for shorter takeoff distance is that you see videos of stole airplanes, particularly, you know, I'll point out, um, you know, like uh, Zen Air, um, you know, high wings, uh, tri gears, all of them. And, you know, yeah, they rotate and they get off the ground really quickly. Um, the Rotax installation of the Sonics, from our experience, it, yeah, it, it, it gets off the ground really quick. And that is a function, of course, of the reduction drive and just having a lot of uh, torque uh, available, um, you know, at those slower speeds and uh, on the takeoff roll. All right. And then let's see here. Uh, Dennis asks, are you offering a cowling for the 912? <laughs> so we offer our standard cowling and the, as, as I've shown you in all of these slides, and I don't mean to, to laugh, but I, I, I kind of talked about this. As I showed you, you know, our effort here is to be able to have a customer be able to use our standard cowling with minimal modifications. So the idea is that, yeah, you might need to cut a hole here and there. You might need to, you know, attach something, glass something to the inside. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing an installation that avoids bump outs of any kind or um, you know major blisters or modifications. Now, as I said, if we decide at the end of the day when our installation's really well hashed out and finalized that you know we want to do something like Casey Cooper has, for instance, with a bit of a blister sort of for the oil cooler inlet, um, what we would do then is we would have our standard cowling as a universal part, and then we'd also have that separate piece that you can um, you know sand your cowling and uh, glass the two together. Got it. Okay. All right. And then uh, Thomas asked, could a Rotax engine be used on a 1X? Uh, yeah, it certainly could. We haven't done anything with it uh, to date. Um, you know, right now, the Rotax, I'm sorry, the, the 1X um, only uh, has VW mounts uh, as an option. Um, although the UL Power dealer uh, down in Georgia actually does make um, motor mounts for the 1X for UL power engines for folks that want them. Um, we just haven't, you know, had any time, you know, the VWs work so well on the 1X, whether it be the Aero-V, the Aero-V Turbo, or one of its competitors, shame on you. Um, no, just kidding. Um, but, um, you know, it, we just hasn't been a high priority. Um, I would, you know, certainly just, you know, making more people happy and giving airplanes more universal appeal to expand the motor mounts that we offer for the 1X someday when we get time. Okay. Uh, Jason chimed in that there's an excellent presentation put on by Lockwood Aviation regarding the use of auto gas and a Rotax. It is in the EA webinars archive. So uh, if you want to learn Great. more on that topic, go by, back and check that. Uh, Richard says, hi, Mark. I apologize if you hit this question already. Ready? Do you plan on doing anything with the Rotax so that the Sonics can go upside down like on a Jabiru 3300? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question. And, um, you know, it's not on our immediate radar. But like I mentioned um, briefly, uh, there's an air show team. Actually, they're not together anymore. But there was an air show team in South America called uh, Hangar Del Cielo. And uh, they flew... Um, uh, excuse me, uh, RANS, the, the mid-wing RANS airplanes. Yeah, the, the, the single seat chaos. and the two seat. So okay. yep. um, I think they had two different names depending on how many seats it had. Mm -hmm. And yep. they did an air show routine. They were actually quite uh, quite daring in their aerobatics. And um, there's actually a, a BRS advertisement that you've seen in sport aviation and other magazines for many years of one of these uh, RANS S10s uh, coming down in the chute with the wing folded on it. And we're proud to say 
that they were able to get themselves in that position because they had the aero injector. Um, and so the aero injector being a throttle body uh, slide carburetor um, doesn't have a float bowl. It works in every any draft orientation and it will run air, in aerobatics. And um, so uh, they, they the air show team um, had to make a custom intake manifold basically to connect the two banks of cylinders to one aero injector. And um, they um, also had a oil system modification um, that they use. And they actually, I do have, still have a copy of the really um, light on details uh, manual, I think of their oil system and, uh, modification if you want to email me and I can send it to you. Um, but you would have to make your own custom intake manifold to, for, for the Rotax. And we haven't, again, just not enough hours in the day, we haven't had a chance to kind of come up with our own there. I think if we were um, they had it on the top of the engine. I would want to do something more like the Aero V to get that carb down low so that we can run gravity feed like we like to run in the Sonics. All right. And then one diverted question onto the Xenos. How well does the prop for the, uh, how, uh, how well does the prop glide for a Xenos? So on the Xenos and, um, uh, I don't have a good picture of it here in this slide deck, but we've always run um, very thin bl uh, blade profile on the prop. In other words, the cord is very small. And the idea is that to save you the expense of a feathering or a folding prop, the expense and complexity and maintenance, um, just run a really thin blade and, um, you know, you set up the engine so when the engine stops, it's top to center has the prop going horizontal across the cooling inlets, protects you from shock cooling and reduces the drag and that gets you, you know, a nice motor glider. Um, the um, the Rotax um, will probably need a wider cord um, just so that you don't have to have too much diameter. Um, so that may affect the drag characteristics. I will tell you the Rotax, um, we, you know, we have to turn the prop over to burp the engine, to burp the oil system. Um, uh, for those of you familiar with the Rotax, you'll know what I'm talking about. And it takes a lot of force to turn that prop. So there's, you know, definitely no question the prop will not windmill when you shut the engine down on something like a Xenos installation. So that isn't a concern. I guess my big concern would be if you're not going to go to a more expensive, more complex folding prop, and you want to do what we do on the Xenos with the, the regular Sensenic prop, you're probably going to have a bit, a bit of a wider paddle there, uh, which may, may uh, you know, impact your soaring. All right, excellent. Uh, Jason chimed in and says, thanks for another super presentation. So with that, Mark, thanks for uh, coming over tonight. And is there any closing comments? No, I just check out our website here. I've got the slide up with uh, our web address, sonicsaircraft.com, uh, sales at sonicsaircraft.com. That gets right to me. So if you want to talk to, um, I guess, the guy where the buck stops, um, you can email that or call the number and ask for me. Uh, check out Aero Conversions products at aeroconversions.com. And if you just want to see some really cool stuff with unmanned aircraft, go to sonicsaerospace.com. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Another great presentation. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, everybody. And uh, have a great holiday season. Good night. Good night, everybody.